Welcome to Cambridge Orthopaedics. My name is Jay Rowell and I'm here to talk to you about vertical shear fractures as part of our series um, about pelvic ring trauma. All right. When we think about vertical shears, we think about a hemipelvis being driven and forced upwards by the force and ferocity of the trauma that's gone through it. And this typically happens from a fall from a height, but it can also happen from a road traffic accident. Passenger footwells and of the footwell of a vehicle can cause via the energy mechanism cabinet intrusion, putting a lot of force onto that leg, driving it backwards, causing a similar sort of mechanism of injury. Indeed, I wonder if the epidemiology would suggest that road traffic accidents are as much of a cause of vertical shear injuries as are a fall from a height. But these, despite their mechanism, are often associated with other injuries. They're often associated with a head injury, chest, abdominal, spinal injuries, lumbar sacral plexus injuries, and other musculoskeletal trauma. What do you want to play? Alexa has just interrupted. Thank you, Alexa. Anytime. Just by the fact that they're tile C, and in the previous episodes we talk about tile C classification and how that's associated with poor functional outcomes. These are associated with poor functional outcomes. They're associated with chronic long-term pain. And we know that the recovery at about a year seems to be predictive of that going onwards up to eight years or more afterwards. They're often associated with bad outcomes. And indeed, they're hard to fix. There are two different sort of there are two different types, maybe unofficially speaking in my mind, those that go through the sacroiliac joint. Um, here I've got my trusty pelvis. So those that have gone through the sacroiliac joint and there there's a disruption um, has occurred, or those that are involved a common uh, an a sacroiliac fracture, and they're often comminuted by their very nature. Now in this paper by Griffin, Starr, Reinhardt, Jones, Whitlock, uh, some big hitters in the world of trauma right there. In that paper, um, they suggested that the, f the failures of fixation occurred in those with the sacral alar trauma. And that may well be because it's, you know, it's less hard, right? The sacral alar, you've got some comminution, it's just a bit more wobbly, and that fixation may fail. And they've got some really good demonstrations and diagrams of that happening. Whereas if you've got a sacral iliac joint and you get that joint together, it's harder surfaces meeting each other without comminution. Okay. So therein lies some of the, the, the methods of fixation. If you're going to fix, you want to have a strong fixation posteriorly, supplemented or complemented by a strong fixation anteriorly. Often these patients are unwell. Often they are patients that have got a head injury or a chest injury. Um, and therefore you wonder if actually putting them prone, let's say for either transacral bars or a U-plate at the back, um, or even a posterior infix, let's say, often they're not well enough for that procedure for quite some time. And therefore, if, you're, uh, if your only option is to do a direct reduction by proning them, then, then, then it may be much harder to achieve that reduction because the patient's had to wait that long and the fracture has got that much more sticky. So often what I was taught on fellowship and how I practice now is through indirect reduction means uh, as far as I can. Here we've got a case, right? So unfortunately, a lot of pelvic ring trauma is often associated with either road traffic accidents, pedestrians, cyclists, horses, or unfortunately falls from height. And therein, there is a lot of mental illness um, and I could go on about mental illness funding, etc., and how possibly how inadequate it is. Um, but we get a lot of unfortunate patients who are having a catastrophic moment in their lives and take a, 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 a leap, um, a fall. Um, this is one such lady. She has uh, had postnatal depression um, shortly after giving birth and uh, jumped from a building in an attempt to kill herself. She sustained this vertical shear fracture. Uh, and you can see on this plain radiograph that it's gone through at the back here on the sacrum. It's a sacral alar fracture, so automatically we would be thinking with our newly gained wisdom that this may well be a, uh, one that could potentially fail through fracture fixation. And we've got a fracture that's gone through the front here. 
she's got a slightly dysmorphic, slightly dysmorphic sacrum. But what I'd like to draw your attention to is on the CT scans on the axials, you often are trying to debate in your mind whether it is a lateral compression or a vertical shear if we're playing the classification game. But the clue sometimes is that as you scroll down from the chest, abdomen, and into the pelvis, you'll see that fractured side quicker than you see the other side because it is closer. So you'll see it, all oh, right, there we go, there's the fractured bits, and then in comes the rest of the pelvis. And that's what you can see here. It looks like we're looking at a part of the pelvis before we're seeing the rest of it. Again, at S2, this is interesting, isn't it? It's in the same, it's, it's a cut in a different plane of one part of the pelvis as compared to the other. We know on the coronal view at the front she's gone anteriorly, the coronal view she's gone superiorly at the back, and it's affected the superior articular um, fossa here of that uh, of the L5-S1 junction, and also the transverse process of L5, which we talked about as a marker of instability. It's all been pushed off. Indeed, if I've probably got slices, may see that L4 has gone as well. Now this may surprise you. Indirect reduction, and this is simply with manual traction, uh, assistant pulling on a leg or myself pulling on a leg whilst uh, I'm trying to put some screws in um, an assistant pulling on the leg and you can over distract it this pelvis is so unstable you can bring it forth bring it back it, it's it's terrible so therefore I thought hmm if we get some sort of sloppy fixation at the back at the front sorry a sloppy fixation at the at the front this may solve a lot of our height issues and and it appears that it does if we look at the the, the uh, sacral ala on the, the uninjured side and we come across here and we see that it's now nicely matched. A view of the foramen's rotational alignment looks similar um, but a sloppy fix just helps get things at the back just right. And then we go on to fix stably um, with a unisacral S1 screw and a transacral S2 screw, restoring the anatomy on the inlet, but most of the deformity here was on the outlet. And let's make sure that we've got it right on the outlet view. Here we can see that we've restored the height on the outlet view as well. So outlet view tells us about the superior inferior migration, was inlet tells us about anterior posterior. Now, we know this is a sacral alar fracture and they're associated with um, difficulty with fixation and, uh, and holding that fixation until union uh, late displacement rates, which is why there are moves I see around uh, the world for going for triangular osteosynthesis um, for uh, vertical shear fractures. Here's another case. I can't remember the story here, but let's say it was another fall from a height and we can see on this CT based topogram um, that we've got a vertical shear that's gone again through the alar and anteriorly through the parasymphyseal region uh, with the right hemipelvis being superiorized and it's got some deformity in the binder as in it's sort of gone up and it's also been a bit squashed together because of the effect of the binder. Uh, this poor gentleman is associated, got a, an associated lumbar spine injury, he's also got a head injury, and when the ICPs become stable because they have been monitored, we can proceed with our surgery. What you can see here, this is a little clue. So he was transferred into uh, a different major trauma center where I worked previously. He was transferred in from another region. He had a damage control laparotomy and pelvic packing was performed, but it was performed by um, non-pelvic surgeons, it was performed by non-trauma surgeons um, and here we can see the, the pelvic pack in the uh, intraperitoneal cavity not really achieving much so it may have helped with some abdominal bleeding um, but probably didn't help with any pelvic ring bleeding if there was any. So beware the unpacked pelvis from elsewhere. Okay. Here we can also see that effect. We're looking at um, the sacral alar here on the right hand side in a different plane to the rest of it. And it's gone superiorly and it's comminuted. In fact, I don't know how much was left. Uh, and we treated that with an infix and SI screws, transacral on both sides. But a lesson from this one is beware the unpacked pelvis. Beware the damage control laparotomy where they pack, think they're packing a pelvis, but 
it, maybe it's inexperience or or what, but they're not in the uh, in, in in the extraperitoneal spaces of the pelvis to pack from front around the side to so where the notch is to where the SI joints are. And here's another case. I've got lots of cases, and I'll keep I could do this all day, but you'll get bored. Ah, yeah. So fragility fractured um, vertical shears can still occur as well. Falls from a, a low height, um, less than two meters classically. And this uh, elderly lady had a total hip replacement in um, and a vertical shear fracture at the front. Here's a root rami. There's a vertical shear fracture going through the sacral alar. There's also a periprosthetic fracture. The binder's on. Um, and the considerations here, how do we get good enough stability in old bone, uh, osteoporotic bone? Um, and so we want to maximize our fixation. So again, not, not as dramatic as the last few cases, uh, but some sacral ADAR comminution there. And here we can see that it's taken off the transverse process. And I'm going to argue it's slightly superiorized as well. So to maximize my hold here, I've gone for a partial threading screw uh, in S1, transsacral, so it's got uh, three cortices on the contralateral pelvis to create the compression I want to create that interference fit between uh, the, the bony fragments. And then I've supplemented that with a fully threaded with loads and loads and loads and loads and loads of grip all the way across transsacral again. If one was being more bold, one could consider also a posterior infix uh, for supplementary fixation. But at the front, here's, here's, here's the issue, and maybe this was a bit naughty. Uh, please don't write anything in the comment section if you think it is naughty. But here's the issue. Do you put an infix at the front, just above a total hip replacement, being aware that infixes being subcutaneous can be associated with an infection. That infection then tracks down to the hip joint. Um, that's not particularly great. Um, so I'm, I don't know if I'm right or wrong in this, but I thought the cement mantle would provide a wonderfully strong purchase uh, for, for a anterior column screw and using this Seldinger screw technique uh, that we're writing up with a drill guide, but now I'm using the screw to, to maintain purchase past the bent guide wire through the cement mantle. And it really gets the anterior column nicely reduced. Look, here we go, displaced, and there we are reduced. Pass it down and follow it up with a nice screw that takes on the deformity of the wire. Because of the comminution, there is some compression at the back, maybe some over compression at the back that is now rigidly hold, held with the transsacral screw. And went on to fix the periprosthetic fracture. Now this is a case from my fellowship. This poor gentleman fell from a height and what we can see here are two injuries to his posterior pelvis. He's got the vertical shear quite clearly demonstrated on that coronal view, but he's also got a much more subtle to see uh, midline parasacral injury here. So the sequence of events in our minds of how do we go about fixing this is to maybe fix the left-hand side, the parasacral first, before addressing the vertical shear. That way you've got a stable base to which to make your reduction. Fortunately at the London, we had the star frame and so we're able to bolt the whole of the left-hand side of the pelvis to the star frame table um, via the means of chance pins and then fix the rest of the pelvis to that. Quite clever. Allows great indirect reduction techniques. So here's a guide wire um, scooching the S1 foramen um, for the para midline sacral injury um, to secure that, followed up by a screw. And here we can see the chance pins in that side of the pelvis. And we can see that with a little bit of traction applied that we've got quite a nice reduction, some comminution here. And that traction is then replicated by a ball spike pusher held onto the crossbar of the star frame. There it is, pushing down on the iliac crest, creating a reduction. Very elegant thing to use. And then we're fixing this vertical shear. We know that they're prone to displacement. So and we've got a good corridor, so we're going for a transsacral uh, S1 screw. Nice and squeezed tight on the down the wing view there with the, the washer flush with that bone. And then here's a hallmark of a screw that may not have been in the right place, therefore removed. 
and a transsacral S2. Here we can see the S1 foramen being tickled a little bit by the guide wire, the S1 foramen on the other side, just creating it low enough to create room for that transsacral S1. And here we can see the disc space of S2 and the frame in there and the frame in there. So really strong, really rigid fixation at the back, supplemented by an infix at the front and we've got a good reduction on inlet, but the problem wasn't on inlet, the problem was on outlet. And we've got a good reduction of that superiorization on outlet. Rotational alignment looks great, frame and look good. Well, so to summarize, really vertical shears are associated with bad outcomes. Bad outcomes because of chronic pelvic pain, lumbar sacral plexus injuries, and all the other injuries associated with that traumatic event. They lend themselves to indirect reduction techniques, and we talked to a few about a few of those already. Proning the patient for direct reduction techniques may be challenging in patients with a high ISS, head injuries, etc. If they are associated with a uh, with sacral comminution um, and a fracture that goes through the alar, they may be harder to get your posterior stability on than those that are associated with sacral iliac joint injuries. But really, maximise your posterior stability with these fractures. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um, please feel free to visit our website and the other videos that are available on YouTube from our group.